Greetings of Earth and Heaven on this day, Sol in Aquarius, Luna waxing in Leo. Let us adore together the Bayoun deity, the Father, Mother, God, who in unity formulates the golden and magical child, the eld, the archetype and hologram of the human race. Nature is a system of nuptials and gives us the language of spirit, by the love of the goddess leading us on to the divine life. The crown of immortality for us is the power of godhood in a kingdom of love, wherein the heart dwells. And here do we adore the Bayoun God in its unity and in love. Love is our essence and our nature. It tinctures the pure expression of the will. In honor of this nameless God, with the love of the goddess, and by the zeal of our spiritual aspiration, are we able to see the soul unveiled, that we might know each other in the light, in beauty, truth, and love. And by way of the essence that is the pure will in each of us, do we in peace and harmony also adore this golden and magical child of the Bayoun God. So that who aspires to knowledge of the heart know that equilib equilibrium is the basis of the work. We must always endeavor to seek light through the strife of contending forces. Rejoice there, therefore, that through thy trials thou shalt triumph. The Master has said, Blessed art thou. Yet, O aspirants, let thy victories bring thee not to vanity. With the increase of Gnosis should come the increase of wisdom. Be sure that thy soul is steadfast. Fear is failure and the forerunner of failure, and courage is the beginning of virtue. Therefore, fear not the spirits, be firm and courteous with them. We are what we make of ourselves, our actions affecting each ourselves and also the entire universe. Worship and neglect not the physical body, which is a temporary connection to the outer material world. Knowledge of the heart starts by strengthening and controlling the animal passions, and by disciplining both the emotions and the reason. Strive ever to nourish the higher aspirations. Verily in heart do we good unto others for its own sake, not for any gratuity. Remember that unbalanced force is evil. We must ever act passionately, think rationally, and each must be thyself. Truly also, have the greatest self-respect and accumulate virtue in all that you do. Virtue is a prelude to holiness. The material act is but the outward expression of our thoughts. We must strive ever to the control of thought and the fixity of our intent. Establish thyself firmly in the e equilibrium of forces, in the center of the cross of the elements, that rosy cross from whose center the creative word issued in the birth of the dawn universe. Therefore must we be prompt and active as the sylphs, Avoiding frivolity and caprice. We must be energetic and strong like the salamanders. Avoiding irritability and ferocity. Also we must be flexible and attentive to images like the undines. Avoiding idleness and changeability. And finally we should be laborious and patient like the gnomes. Avoiding grossness and avarice. In true religion there is no sect. Therefore take heed that thou blaspheme not the name of which another knoweth as God. For if thou do this in Jupiter, thou wilt blaspheme Jehovah, and in Osiris, Yeshua. Ask, and you shall have. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Welcome again to our online audience here at the Gnostic Church of Light. Today we're going to talk about the schools of magic. Uh, great misunderstanding today as to what they are, uh, especially with uh, a lot of populist occultism going on and people kind of making things up because it feels and seems right. So uh, I'm going to start with 
just a very basic definition of magic. It's a word that implies wisdom, and it's a praxis derived from a philosophical point of view. There are three possible uh, philosophical schools in general. Uh, one is nihilism, the other is monism, and the last is dualism. Uh, these do not necessarily respond, uh, correspond to the three schools of magic, the three schools of magic being yellow, white, and black. Note, though, that these three schools in their uh, coloration are represented in our mythology as the three magi that uh, visited, or kings, that visited the Christ child. Uh, you know, uh, one being an Asian, another being an African, and another being a European. So, you know, the Asian then sh indicates the yellow school of magic, the African the black school, and the European the white school. Um, these are, you know, these three magi are also then called kings, and, you know, as they have attained wisdom and ennoblement. But the races themselves, even though we describe the races by these colors um, in the mythos, the magic doesn't belong to these races. In other words, the Asian race is not representative of the yellow school, the African race not representative of the black school, and the European race not representative of the white school. And in, indeed, I would even argue that this whole idea of race is uh, rather absurd. There's one race, the human race. There are various ethnicities that we might call yellow, black, and white. Um, and that's important so that when we think about what racism may be, it's actually taking these ethnicities and, and supposing that they are various and separate races. So when we see even the most, uh, shall we say, liberal amongst us that, um, you know, would call somebody a racist or refer to themselves as being racially correct or what have you, they're still participating in racism. To divide anyone from this race, this human race, is racism. No matter how you divide them and no matter how, what good feelings you may have about, you know, other ethnicities that are not your own. Now, nihilism itself can really have no expression in magic as it, as it upholds the idea of the futility and meaninglessness of life. That might seem a little uh, bit incongruous with this idea of existentialism where the meaningless of life is at the root core of what existentialism is about. But I don't think existentialism is really uh, devolving into nihilism. Okay, radical nihilism denies humanity the right to posit a beyond in all the things that could be said to, to be divine. It, it holds out a pessimism for humanity to alter the human condition into which we are born. It is a psychological discouragement that results from when arriving uh, uh, one uh, arriving uh, that all one's efforts at personal evolution have been in vain. One arriving at the idea that all one's personal efforts are in vain. The idea that the Buddhists uphold life is sorrow implies the meaninglessness of existence. You know, all goals in this life are philosophically moot, so that if human existence ever had one, it has already been attained. Um, Escaping the wheel of reincarnation is a yearning for annihilation. Um, and this is the center of the Buddhist philosophy. Reality itself is viewed as entirely, entirely illusory, so that appearance equals suffering. Now, that doesn't mean that one can't strive or decide that they do want to escape reincarnation and go for complete annihilation. Um, there's nothing wrong with that aspiration. Indeed, in the Gnostic Mass, uh, that is said to be uh, one of the possible attainments that one might hold out for. So we're not arguing against the inviability of uh, Buddhism. Um, yet overall, Buddhism may said to relate to the Yellow School of Magic so far as monism can posit this idea that the world is an illusory expression of the spiritual world. There's no difference between uh, the spiritual world and the, the material world in monism, and, you know, all is one. So the question is, where do you focus your mind on the elements that are important in this world or that you reject the illusion of this world, the maya, the samsara that we talked about in our last uh, sermon, uh, and you know, just simply yearn for that pure spiritual life. 
you know, uh, which, you know, uh, to betray my own personal thought on that, I'd say, well, you know, just shoot yourself and get it over with. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's really rather a sardonic expression, and, and I hope nobody takes me seriously on that. Um, the Yellow School does not hold on to any form of pessimism, and the opportunity to evolve a consciousness is provided. In other words, one can evolve one's consciousness to focus purely on that spiritual aspiration. The Yellow School holds out this view of the unity as the fabric of the universe, and the separateness of the spiritual world is yet an illusion. You know, um, and, of course, this can support the uh, uh, philosophy of monism. Uh, you know, we are all one. And monism, of course, uh, I should have said, supports the, the philosophy of monotheism, that we are all one. And, and monotheism, of course, is, you know, uh, comes about through Christianity, uh, through the effect of Buddhism on the development of the early Gnostic schools from which Christianity would emerge. Uh, within the unity of the universe, a philosophical debasement comes about as the, its adepts realize their impotence to alter its totality to even the slightest degree. These adepts develop a contemplative attitude that is relatively stoic in nature. Uh, the first noble truth of the Buddha, everything is sorrow, is confused or conflated with the idea of sin, uh, which the black school of magic used to infuse into Christianity. And this is why today we would say Christianity is of the black school. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, like the white school of magic, the black school affirms the material materiality of the universe is as actual and real. All phenomena in the material universe is then viewed to be accursed, so that everything that is even in any way pleasant would be considered malignantly deceptive. All pleasure is, uh, is either a sin or against the law, which is the common joke, right? If you're having fun, you're either sinning or breaking the law. Uh, as the Buddhists assert that the cause of sorrow is desire, so desire co becomes the motive for sin in the black school. Every action in the universe is both unavoidable and a crime, original sin. Okay, making ignorance and the blackness of the mind to be the key to the foundation of their universe. In other words, one should not have any awareness of the world. One does not need to develop intellect. One simply needs to avoid sin and to avoid the pleasures of this world. So only by ceremonial removal of their sins and by proxy can there be any hope of redemption from punishment because this God has bound humanity into a contract that uh, once they're born, they're bound by this contract and they simply have to undo their original sin in order to make it to some divine treasure in the afterlife. Uh, most conventional religion today even belongs to the black school. Faith and belief stand firm over knowledge and experience, giving viability to ignorance as a virtue. So that as power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, the adepts of the black school feed off the ignorance of their adherents, taking in material profit and holding political office in order to ensure the viability of their position. The clerical class becomes the key to enforce this power, as fear and punishment are their tools. Like the yellow and white schools, the black school holds no empathy for humanity and views them to be hopeless fools. Uh, the core of humanity has no desire for enlightenment, and proselytizing only has value insofar as it can bring more customers in regards to the consumer culture that the black school has now instituted. The Black School of Magic, though, well, I should say, before I go to this next part, I should say that um, the Black School stands directly counter to the White School because both of these schools are dualist schools, unlike the monism of the Yellow School. And so being dualist schools, they naturally evoke a, a, a natural antipathy towards each other. We will talk a little bit more about the White School. Uh, however, the Black School of Magic is not ignoble per se. 
Um, and it is certainly different from what is called the Black Lodge. And here is where these supposed brothers of the, uh, where these supposed left hand pathers today um, really uh, don't understand. Um, the Black Lodge is really a perversion of the white school of magic. And um, the Black Lodge involves the failure of the highest attainment, the highest initiation. Um, you know, uh, it, it's called the ordeal of the abyss. And failure in the abyss puts one as a black brother in the Black Lodge. That doesn't mean that they've become lords of evil, but we can see black brothers, because they mistake themselves to be the only god or the special messenger of God, they generally do become cult leaders. And it doesn't matter which god they decide they ought to be a special messenger of, whether they're the special messenger of Jehovah or Jesus or of Crowley or of any other uh, being. I've heard people say that they were the reincarnation of Alan Watts and the reincarnation of Carlos Castaneda. These guys are not necessarily uh, the adepts that failed the ordeal of the abyss either. They're usually psychotic to some degree as well. So this can be a terrible, confusing mess together. However, in the ordeal of the abyss, that highest initiation, one learns that he or she is God. Like I've said here at the church repeatedly, you are God. I am God. We are God. They are God. It is God. Okay, uh, but they mistake uh, the, themselves to be the only God as their ego becomes inflated, and they hold themselves above all others. That highest ordeal is to step outside yourself, which some call stepping outside the ego, the sense of self. And uh, it is only in that place that you're capable of seeing your divinity. But if you hold on to the least ounce of your ego, in that ordeal of the abyss, you will become to believe that you are the only God or that special divine messenger. We're all gods, which is the principal tenet of white school. But to come to know ourselves and our true nature is the core part of our task. Therefore, we must flood our minds with light, the opposite of the black school. That means intelligence, creativity, um, an awareness of the ways of the world as much as an awareness of the ways of the spirit and the soul. Uh, the white school holds that everything is holds that everything is sorrow only for the profane. Those fools that prefer their dark, ignorant minds. The initiate is taught to transform sorrow into joy. It is said that um, uh, Zoroaster, the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble reading my note here. Um, uh, it is, well, I'm, I'm a little lost here. The first note that nature teaches us and the oracles also affirm that even the evil germs of matter may alike become useful and good. Um, so, in the Bhagavad Gita, interestingly enough, Krishna uh, uses a lie to protect Dharma. And I'm assuming that my note, what I'm confused here is I should have written Zoroaster, um, was the first to note that nature teaches us, and the oracles also affirm, that even the evil germs of matter may alike become useful and good. Um, Zoroaster was, and somehow, uh, Manichaeism worked into Zoroaster's thoughts, and so there became this war against good and evil. That's the dualism, again, of the black and white schools, but it gets taken too far as these schools become too virulently antagonistic towards each other. And again, so in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna loses chooses a lie to protect dharma, which means truth. So um, think of that as the yin and yang. You know, in the black section of the yin yang symbol, there is a white dot, and in the white section, there is a black dot. There's no pure good or absolute good, and there's no pure evil or absolute evil. As we teach in the white school, evil and good are relative points. Each needs each other to express the other. So that the co-acceptance of light and darkness is the key to understanding the dualism of the white school. Like the black school, the white school accepts a divine and material realm. The only real distinction is how to dwell in this material realm. Rather than abuse its adherence, the white school bids them to know thyself. It holds out a Gnosticism in contrast with faith and belief. Experience for the white school is a sacrament. All our interactions in the world are then Eucharistic. So therefore, we 
truly affirm that life is pure joy. It requires, though, a, a responsibility. And that responsibility is in knowledge, both to know thyself and to educate thyself in every way possible, whether that be um, through culture and cultural affirmation, psychology, philosophy, mathematics, science. Uh, there is every endeavor in the uh, liberal arts uh, to uh, help us to come to understand and find and manufacture our own meaning in life. And these subjects themselves are way too vast for any of us to maintain, so we must find our own paths to this. This affords us many different ways of expression, many different thoughts and insights, a, a, a plurality of ideas and uh, ideologies and yearning and striving. And it, it, we cannot say that any one thing is right or any one person is right, any one opinion is right. We can only affirm that everybody has their own point of view, and every point of view is valuable, even those points of view that we may not ourselves care for. And that becomes a real a contentious thing for a lot of people. A lot of people, especially those trained in the dark school that have not chosen to try to come out of that world of ignorance, but truly delve into the darkness of their minds as the proper state, um, they'll find a great problem with that, such an affirmation. But truly, Every message is divine. We truly do not know where the world is going, whether the world is good, bad, or indifferent. Um, the world will take care of itself. Can you take care of yourself? Do you have the effort in you, the aspiration to know thyself, the greatest yearning that the mind could have? So with that, we'll, uh, I'll thank you again for attending today. Thanks for um, listening and uh, please note we're still with our funding drive we have another month left to it we're hoping uh, some of you will find what we're doing valuable enough that you'll come to uh, decide that this is your church and you'll take ownership of it a small donation can go a long way so we'd really really appreciate that we want to grow we want to grow with you we want you to be with us and uh it is, uh, you know, it, it is just the reality of the world that money is what, in part, what makes that happen. The other part of that is your affinity and our fi mutual affinity so that we can grow together in body and spirit. So uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you. Please make comment on this as you find us online and uh, continue to grow and be creative. Take care. We'll go on to the Eucharist of the Five Elements now. For Osiris Anakwith, who was found perfect before the gods had said, These are the elements of my body, perfected through suffering, glorified through trial. For the scent of the dying roses, as the repressed sigh of my suffering, 
and the flame red fire is the energy of mine undaunted will. In the cup of wine is the pouring out of the blood of my heart, sacrificed unto regeneration, unto the newer life. The bread is the foundation of my body, which I transform readily that it may be renewed. For I am a sire's triumphant, even a sire's on office, the justified. I am he who is clothed with the body of flesh, yet in whom is the spirit of the great gods. I am the Lord of life, triumphant over death. He who partaketh with me shall arise with me. I am the manifester in matter of those whose abode is in me invisible. I am purified. I stand upon the universe. I am its reconciler with the eternal gods. I am the perfecter of matter, and without me the universe is not. I am come in the power of the light. I am come in the mercy of the light. I am come in the light of wisdom. The light hath healings in its wings. Blessed be thou, Lord of the universe, for thy glory flows out to the ends of the universe rejoicing. Through thirty ethers I summon the forces of the universe in myself. I inhale the perfume of the rose, for the air is the sweetness of life. I feel the warmth of the sacred lamp for the, the fire of my very own spirit. I taste this cake of light to nourish the foundation of my renewed body. I drink this wine, that the body may become infused with spirit. Finally, the ringing of the bell chants my soul unto the city of the pyramid. Behold the doctrine of the four yachts. Integral, integrity. The integral man and woman seeks always to do that which is benevolent, yearning to do that which is right. Without prospect of profit, he or she dedicates him or herself to what is good, and without pressure from others, he or she redresses his or her errors. Good deeds are accumulated, as it is known that they will be sufficient to create character in us. If bad deeds are not accumulated, they will not be sufficient to disrupt our lives. The petty man or woman thinks that small good deeds are unimportant and does not do them. He or she uh, thinks that small bad deeds are unimportant and does not abstain from them.
This, thus, his, his or her evil accumulates until it can no longer be disguised, and his or her unconscious guilt grows until it can no longer be suppressed. The noble man or woman strives to harvest virtue in all its forms. Intent. Intent is not a thought or an object or a wish. Intent is what can make a man or woman succeed when his or her thoughts say that he or she is defeated. It operates in spite of one's self-indulgence and generates invulnerability and impeccability. He or she then walks the path with heart and waits for an opening to freedom. Sufficient personal power leads to the mastery of intent. Our reality is completely and entirely based upon our intent. It is a sign of considerable advance when a man begins to be moved by the will, by his own energy, self-determined, instead of being moved by desire, by a response to an external attraction or repulsion. Intent creates your reality. What are you intending for yourself? You can recognize it by listening to your real wishes, the ones with emotional buttons on them. The wishes that make you cry or scare you enough to make you cringe or bring a huge smile across your face just thinking about them. They are buried deep inside and they are the force that moves you in this life. Intelligence. All matter is alive and is, and is in its own way intelligent. Matter is made manifest by its rate of vibration. The frequency of vibration in matter and its density provide for us a key to the level of consciousness in dwelling any being or object. Its rate of vibration shows us the degree of its intelligence. Nothing is dead or inanimate in nature. Everything exists in some degree of animation. Everything is alive and in its own way is an expression of universal mind. Only this all-pervading consciousness and intelligence is expressed in a different way in all the diverse beings made manifest. The degree of consciousness in any one thing corresponds to the degree of its density or the speed of its vibrations. The more dense the matter, the less conscious it is and the less intelligent. In our bodies, we must strive ever to raise the rate of vibration of our flesh, as we know that flesh contributes to the quality of thought in our brain. Also, the greater the rate vibration of any particular being, the more conscious and the more intelligent the matter. Hence, intelligence is related to adaptation. The more intelligent an individual, the better able he or she is to adapt to the circumstances of life. He or she then learns to accept the world as it is and is not confounded by finding it not to be what he or she might want it to be. Intuition. Every one of us possesses the faculty, the interior sense that is known by the name of intuition. But how rare are those who know how to develop it? It is, however, only by the aid of this faculty that men can ever see things in their true colors. It is an instinct of the soul which grows in us in proportion to the employment we give it, and which helps us to perceive and understand the realities of things with far more certainty than can the simple use of our senses in the exercise of our reason. What are called good sense and logic enable us to see only the appearance of things, that which is evident to everyone. The instinct spoken here being a projection of our perceptive consciousness, a projection which acts from the subjective to the objective and not vice versa, awakens in us spiritual senses and power to act. These senses assimilate to themselves the essence of the object or the action under examination and present it to us as it really is, not as, as it appears to our physical senses and to our cold reason. In the words of Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, we begin with instinct, we end with omniscience. So with that I'll say, the Lord bless you. The Lord enlighten your minds, comfort your hearts, and sustain your bodies. The Lord bring you to the accomplishment of pure will, the great work, the summum bonum, true wisdom, and perfect happiness. Thank you. Yeah.